Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Mayor Steve Hagri. Welcome to our COVID-19 uh, Frequently Asked Questions session, which we've been having periodically uh, over the last five, five weeks or so. Today, I'm delighted uh, to have a conversation with two experts uh, in the area of mental health. People have heard me talk about uh, my growing concern as mayor of uh, mental health needs in our community in normal times. And here we are facing uh, a crisis of global propor global proportions right now. Um, and I know that anxiety is heightened. I know that stress is heightened. I know that people who were in a bad situation and escaped from that because they went to school or they went to work are now living um, uh, in a really, really difficult situation. Uh, and so I wanted us as a community to have a conversation and answer questions that you have on uh, Facebook Live. We're doing this on Facebook Live and Channel 16. Uh, so if you hop on the Facebook Live in the city of Evanston, uh, you can see and follow and, and add a question if you have. We have some questions already that people have sent in. Uh, so I said I'm delighted to have two experts with us today. Um, one is Dr. Ada Gooden. Uh, and I'll have Dr. Gooden introduce herself and give uh, background, but uh, I am delighted to have her on the uh, on the phone today. Uh, she is the uh, director of community um, programs for the Family Institute um, here in Evanston, which is a wonderful uh, organization that supports many, many families and couples uh, here. And then we also have Dr. Christine Somerville with us. And Dr. Somerville is the uh, program director uh, for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, uh, another wonderful organization uh, that really helps try to destigmatize mental health. It's really no different than us having a physical health problem. Um, and, um, and she's with us today. Both of these organizations, uh, represented by uh, Dr. Somerville and uh, Dr. Gooden or someone else uh, in her um, organization, are represented on the mayor's uh, COVID-19 task force that I've set up. And I've tried to get representatives from different sectors who are all part of that task force and recently folks from the mental health uh, community. Because again, I think this is such a, um, a growing concern. And as this crisis continues to go on, I think we're going to see uh, more uh, significant uh, mental health issues that, that, we all, um, that we all encounter. Uh, so with that, what I'd like to do uh, is just get you um, uh, uh, a little familiar with each of our each of our guests today. So I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Gooden if she'll go first. Um, just a little introduction, not too much about yourself, and uh, let's just start off with um, what the the two or three biggest concerns that you have right now um, in light of this crisis that we're. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Mayor Haggerty. Um, so my name is Dr. Adia Gooden, and I am the Director of Community Programs and Outcome Measurement at the Family Institute. And I'm also a licensed clinical psychologist. So I see clients, I see individuals and couples, and I've continued to see clients during this time, um, all via teletherapy. Um, and so I would say the primary concerns that um, I've experienced in my own life and that I've seen in my clients are one, the stress of the uncertainty, right? So not knowing when this is all going to end, when we are going to get out of this space where we have to social distance, where we have to shelter in place, and the stress and anxiety that comes with that, whether people are losing jobs, um, concerned about reduction in, in paychecks, um, or kind of maybe working on the front lines as healthcare providers and feeling stressed about the risk um, that they are experiencing. Um, there's a lot, also a lot of stress and tension that's happening in relationships right now. So everybody is at home together if they're able to, um, if they don't have to go to work. And so being at home together can really place a strain on relationships, on romantic relationships and familial relationships. And uh, so that's another stressor and challenge um, that people are experiencing. And then I think the third thing I would say is 
how people can sort of balance um, working and taking care of themselves, right? We live in a culture and a society that really promotes productivity. And so I think people are feeling a lot of tension between wanting to get a lot done, wanting to be productive, but really needing rest and really needing to slow down. And so the sort of question of how do you, how do we take care of ourselves in the midst of a crisis, in the midst of increased stress is another thing that I'm um, talking a lot with people about and thinking about myself. Great, thank you, thank you, Doctor. How about you, Doctor Somerville? What are the uh, just a little introduction and you know two or three big concerns that you have given this crisis? Well, thank you for having me, also Mayor Haggerty. Um, so I am the director of programs at NAMI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Health, um, and we provide education and support to individuals and families, um, individuals who are living with a mental health condition and family members who are caregivers of a loved one with a mental health condition. Uh, we do advocacy work also on behalf of that. Um, usually we see individuals who have received a diagnosis already, so post-diagnosis, and we see family members and individuals uh, before during and even after the time that they're in treatment. So they come to us looking for resources. And I would say that the, the top issues that I am concerned about and that we are dealing with at NAMI are um, the isolation of individuals and family members and um, trying to help them navigate their um, mental health at a time in which um, those tools for navigation are perhaps not viable right now since they're sheltering at home. Um, so helping families figure out how to maintain their mental health while they're sheltering in place is a big issue. Um, and then also because we are um, one of 500 affiliates in the country that provides resources for these families, it's making sure that we can adequately get information out about where the resources are in their communities, how to connect people with those resources, make sure that they have the tools to do it, whether it be via you know technology or telephone or email or that kind of thing. So it's really connecting people to resources. Um, it's harder now these times because we're at home um, and can't go out and look for them. And um, so those are the main issues we're, we're facing right now. Great, great. And, and I want to uh, mention this for anyone that is watching watching right now. Um, the state of Illinois and all the states really around around this country have received um, crisis counseling grants from the federal government through the disaster programs, the FEMA disaster programs. Um, and if anyone uh, feels the need that they need to talk to, you know, a counselor or anything like that, a statewide number has been set up that will then connect you to people in your own professionals in your own community. And I just want to share this information uh, and we'll put it out there as well on the Facebook Live so it's it's there. Um, but this is, it's called the Illinois Call or Calm, it's a number four, or Calm text line. Um, and uh, it's text talk uh, to, and then you can send to the number five, five two zero two zero uh, or in Spanish it would be habla h a b l a r uh, and that will link you to uh, a counselor in, in your area so we'll share information throughout this uh, with the professionals as, as well uh, let's let's go right to uh, a comment that both of both of you made um, and that was, um, you know, how do you take care of yourself at a, at a time like this when we have so many restrictions placed on us? So, um, Dr. Gooden, why don't you start and then we'll go to Dr. Summerall on that. Sure. So, you know, 
I know that self-care is sort of become this thing that's associated with a lot of things that maybe cost money or, you know, people want to post on social media. But I think about the core of self-care as being really helpful for us right now. And those cores are getting enough rest, right? We, most adults need um, seven to eight hours of sleep and kids and teenagers need even more than that, maybe nine to 10 hours. And when we sleep, our body, First of all, that boosts our immune system, which we really need right now. It allows our, our system to sort of regulate and calm down and relax. So prioritizing getting enough sleep, prioritizing eating regularly and eating foods that are nourishing to your body, um, you know, limiting the amount of caffeine and the amount of alcohol that you consume because those things can sort of shift our moods in ways that can be unhelpful and exacerbate anxiety or depression. Um, taking time alone can be really important, right? So if you are in a house with your whole family and it's really hard to get space, maybe consider taking a walk, you know, put your mask on, maybe take a walk by yourself, or if you have a car, sitting in the car or just finding a little space, maybe it's just in the bathroom and you can close the door so you can have alone time. And then also finding ways uh, to connect with people, right? We know it's not the same as in person, but Zoom calls and FaceTime and different ways of connecting with people so you can see people's faces, laugh together, play games together can be really important in terms of taking care of ourselves during the, during this time. And, and uh, anything to add to that, Dr. Somerville? Yeah, that was a very good list of things, strategies. I would say, you know, it's really important to maintain sort of routines in one's life. So having daily routines is important. Sometimes in a difficult situation like this, um, just um, making your bed in the morning, um, putting on, you know, clothes that you would put on if you were going outside to make yourself feel like you're living a normal life. Um, I would say, you know, also if you're working from home, it's important to create a structure around that. Um, dedicate some space in your home to do that. Make sure that you um, schedule breaks so that you get up and move around, stretch, um, have lunch, maybe, you know, connect with coworkers via whatever tools you have and have virtual coffee breaks together. Um, yeah. And also not just not spending too much time talking about COVID-19 because, you know, I think we're all consuming the information and it's important that we're consuming reliable information and that we don't get overwhelmed and um, become just very hungry for the information to the point where we can't stop because that can happen. Right. I want to go back to just a one hour news during the day, you know, like it <laughs> used to be in the old days, you turn on the nightly news, you got a half an hour news and that was pretty much it. And now it's 24 seven on your devices, on your TV. Right. Um, and that alone can just cr increase your anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. uh, about what's, you know, what's good, what's going on. Um, you know, you said something uh, that I just wanted to make a comment to the, to the viewers about, which was, um, uh, you know, um, making sure that you take care of yourself and, and get outside if you need some alone time, you know, on your own. Uh, I've had some people come to me and say, Mayor, you know, why haven't you shut down the lakefront? Why haven't you shut down parks? And, you know, sports courts are shut down. And that's that's stressful for some people because they love to play tennis, they love to play basketball, and it's not available right now. We've shut down playgrounds, which is really hard for people with young kids. Uh, and their kids don't understand. They just want to go to the playground. Uh, but again, the medical professionals and our public health experts are like, we cannot have the playgrounds open, open right now. Um, but we've maintained, you know, the lakefront in terms of keeping it open. Chicago chose to close to close it. I think there's a big difference between Chicago's lakefront and our lakefront. Chicago's has a lot of sports fields on their lakefront and sports courts much more than much more than we do. And so we've taken a different approach. Our approach has been one of a really strong you know, public information campaign about strict distancing when you're when you're outside, um, you know, meaning keeping at least six feet from one another. We're recommending uh, that you uh, wear a face covering when you can't be uh, six feet or more apart from people. 
Uh, we're going to be coming out with more about that later today, actually, in the communication uh, to, to Evanston. Um, but I think for to, to, to take a drastic measure like closing off uh, the parks, um, you know, just further complicates, in, you know, I think people's physical health, their, men their mental health. And so that's why we have taken the approach that we've taken. We patrol more of those areas. Uh, and for the most part, all in all, we think there's a high level of compliance here in Evanston uh, to what the health, public health professionals are asking us all to do. So I appreciate everybody um, doing doing that. Um, and we're going to continue down the, the, the strategy that we're taking here in Evanston um, so that people can um, have the ability to walk around their, their neighborhood. And remember, not everybody has you know, a home where somebody can escape to a certain room or anything like that. We have many, many people living here in Evanston that live in apartments um, with several people. So um, let's go to a uh, question. We've got a question in from uh, Jim. Um, and we'll start with you on Dr. Somerville on this one. Um, do you have any suggestions for coping mechanisms that might address a feeling of loss of control that I'm sure many people are experiencing right now? Yeah, um, so part of that is, as I mentioned before, um, staying, ma making sure that you have a structure of the things that you know, you know, in your normal daily life, you could control. Um, so the things that you can, that you did prior to COVID-19 that were um, self-agency activities, taking charge of things, you can still do those. You should still be doing those. In fact, you should be doing them with purpose and intentionality um, I would say get up in the morning and sort of lay out your day. Um, know that you're going to have certain times when you're going to do certain things. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that it's important to have that structure, to have that support, to reach out to family members, to um, meditate if that's what will work for you. Um, yeah, I think, you know, those are a few things, a few strategies I can think of. Dr. Good, do you have anything to add to those strategies? Yeah, um, I really echo what Dr. Somerville is sharing. I think structure and routine are really helpful to kind of gain a sense of control, right? So having a regular bedtime and a regular time that you wake up and having some regular routines and things that you do in the day can be very helpful. I also think that it can be helpful to sort of shrink the window that you think about, right? So when you start thinking about what's gonna be happening six months from now or eight months from now, that's when we start to get more overwhelmed and we can start to catastrophize or think about the worst possible outcome. But if you sort of shrink it down and say, okay, well, what's gonna happen in the next week? Or what do I want to happen in the next day or two? And maybe even the next month, but sort of shortening it, right? The more anxious and overwhelmed and out of control you feel, the shorter the time block should be. So if you're having trouble just getting out of bed in the morning, shrink it to an hour. What do you want to do in the hour? Can you get out of bed? Can you brush your teeth? Can you take a shower? Can you eat some breakfast, right? And then go to the next hour. Maybe it's looking at the day, maybe it's looking at the week. So instead of when your mind tries to pull you way into the future, see if you can bring it back to what's happening today, what's happening this week. And that will help you feel like you have a little bit more certainty and control. You know, I would add one, I would add one more thing to that. And that is, you know, all of us doing all of our stuff in the space of our home most of the time our activities sort of blend together. So even if you're working at home, you might be also doing laundry at the same time. You might be cooking, you might be doing a lot of things all at once. And so I think it's important in terms of feeling that sense of control to set boundaries of what you're going to do at what time. And also it's important to have boundaries around work, your work time and the time that you're not working. So make sure if you work from nine to five, at five o'clock, you turn that computer off. And you know you do things that you would be doing if you weren't at the office. And those are um, activities that give you, yourself a sense of control, I think. I need help with that work boundary thing, <laughs> doctor. Let me ask you guys, is, are there, is there anyone out there or many people out there that don't have any level of anxiety? Isn't anxiety um, a natural, um, um, I don't know if it's emotion or how, how you describe that, the feeling that, that everybody has 
can have at some level in their lives. Is that? I, yeah, I think everybody has anxiety of some kind. Anxiety is good and bad. So the anxiety that we experience sometimes is um, manifest as motivation, um, persistence, determination. Um, so those feelings that we have, we channel them into productive activities. But um, I, you know, I think just about everyone has some kind of anxiety. Some of it's good and some of it's not. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. Another way to sort of think about anxiety as being sort of like on a bell curve. And if you have too little, like if, you know, for those who are in school or used to be in school, if you have little, very little anxiety about the test, you may not study, you may not prepare, you may not make sure you're ready. And so that's not going to be very helpful. And then there's sort of an optimal level where you're kind of like, okay, I really want to do well. This is important. I'm a little kind of you know, I want to prepare because I'm a little worried that if I don't prepare, I might not do well. That's optimal. And then if you have too much, it's overwhelming. You're in the test. You can't think about anything but worrying about failing. And so I think, you know, that challenge is to just notice for ourselves where we're at. And the same could be said of, you know, social distancing, right? Those who have no anxiety about getting sick may not be protecting themselves as much as they need to. Those who have that sort of right amount are still, you know, maybe taking a walk, but keeping socially distanced, taking care of themselves. Those who are really, really anxious, may be afraid to leave the house at all, may not be connecting with people, may not be taking care of themselves, may be just really struggling to function. And so anxiety is a normal response and it can tell us some important things. And so it's really about sort of listening and figuring out when is it helpful, when is it not helpful? And if it's not helpful, what are the strategies um, that you can use to try to manage it um, so you can function well? Yeah, you know, what's always helped me um, and I've spent a lifetime working on big disasters and helping communities recover after them, including 9-11, uh, which is probably the most, the largest national emergency that we had in this country until this uh, recent disaster, COVID-19. And I've always, it, it's always been a common force for me just to think back in history and all of the challenges that you know, other generations have come and the uncertainty that existed at that time. They didn't know how a war was going to end or a pandemic that they had in 1918, how that was go going to end. Um, and it was a really scary, it was a really scary, uncertain time. Um, and, you know, I just looking back at that and seeing that they, you know, uh, as challenging and they have been more challenging, right, than what we're facing right, right now. Uh, came through it, you know, this too shall pass, uh, that that adage um, just brings a level of calm to me um, during these uncertain times. We'll get a question from uh, Avon, um, and uh, let's start with you, Dr. Gooding, on this one. Um, what advice would you give to a male who lives alone, takes medication for depression, but still struggles with depression during this time of isolation? Mm -hmm. So I think the first thing I would do is just um, acknowledge that it's normal to be struggling with depression, especially if you've already been diagnosed with it, for it to get worse during this time, right? It's normal for mental health symptoms to be exacerbated by a time of stress and crisis. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that because what we don't want people to do is blame themselves or feel like something is wrong with them, that things have gotten worse or symptoms have gotten worse. So that's the first thing is to just acknowledge this is a hard time right now and it makes sense if you if your symptoms have gotten worse. And so to try to be patient and kind with yourself about that. I would encourage if the person is not in therapy to reach out and try to find therapy. So I know most, you know, therapy practices are providing teletherapy options right now. We are at the Family Institute in both our staff practice and our clinic. Um, and so that may be a really helpful resource um, to, you know, rem remember coping strategies, learn new coping strategies for depression. And then I would also say finding other ways to connect with people, whether that's family members virtually, or, you know, I know um, Dr. Somerville can talk about some of the support groups that NAMI offers that are virtual, but finding more ways to connect because depression can cause us to self-isolate. And so therefore isolation like this can really exacerbate depression. And we have to sort of make more of an effort to reach out and connect to people than we might normally um, because we don't have those normal ways of interacting that we usually would. 
Dr. Somerville, do you want to add? Well, yeah, I would say, um, you know, it's really important to maintain your social networks, whatever they might be. Um, So uh, during this difficult time, you know, make sure that you have the contact information of the phone numbers or the email addresses of people who are in your close social circle, but also people who maybe you don't talk to a lot, um, that you haven't seen for a while, and, uh, you know, reach out to them, because one of the things that's really uh, helpful to an individual who may be struggling is to do something that you know is helping another individual. So caring for other people while you yourself um, need some care is a really good strategy. So offer help to other people and, you know, ask for help when you need it. I think part of part of the thing that people struggle with sometimes is that they feel like they're alone when they're not alone and they feel like they should be able to handle it and they don't ask for help when they need it. Um, and to share your feelings with people with whom you really trust. Um, so, you know, take that chance, open up, be vulnerable, and um, let the people who care for you um, help you in that way. Great, great, thank you. You know, um, I just want to share with folks uh, that um, in Evanston, uh, the city does have a contract with Amida Help, uh, which allows residents to get mental health assessments. Uh, one-on-one home visits, although that may be uh, on hold right now because of because of COVID-19, but consultation uh, with healthcare professionals. So uh, if you want me to do avail yourself of, of that service or wanted to, uh, just call the city's 311 uh, line and they'll, they'll connect you and get you uh, information there. You both have talked about um, teletherapy. You know, here, telemedicine. We're hearing lots of tele stuff. We didn't even know Zoom existed until like a month ago, and here we are. Could you talk to us about um, how teletherapy works, right? Because I've seen, you know, you, you know, counselor before. Many people have, and every and everything else. And there's something, uh, it's a human connection that occurs when it's one on one. And um, you know, and now we're talking about over a screen, like we're talking about now, or on a telephone. Uh, so, could you just talk to folks about that, both? people that may have been in um, some sort of counseling uh, prior to COVID-19 and those that are feeling like we should do this now, it may help, it may help me or whatever right now. Can you talk a little about that? Uh, We'll we'll start um, with Dr. uh, Gritton. Sure. So, you know, it certainly is different to do therapy video via a video conferencing method. Um, And what I have found personally and what, you know, we've done some preliminary research at the Family Institute around the experiences of our clients um, and our therapists in doing teletherapy is that it still provides a really important and meaningful space for people to, you know, cope with challenges and make changes and um, heal um, themselves and their relationships. And so what happens um, at the Family Institute, for instance, we use uh, an encrypted version um, of Zoom, which is HIPAA compliant, which means that, you know, your information is safe and um, generally we don't record sessions unless it's a trainee. Um, and so, you know, we're really kind of looking into the screen, looking at each other. I will say that we can still pick up a lot in terms of seeing a client, right? And client seeing us and our facial expression. So it might be a little bit different than sitting in the room together, um, but I've been able to have some really meaningful sessions. I think it can be really helpful for people to turn off notifications, silence their phone, things like that, because when we're staring at a computer screen, we're used to doing a bunch of different things. And so it can be harder to focus. Um, But what we found is that clients are really appreciative. Clients find the the space helpful. And even therapists who do therapy with children and families are finding really creative ways to use the whiteboard in Zoom and to play games and to do all sorts of things that can really still support um, children and families during this time. And, you know, I would say if if there are people out there who are considering doing therapy for the first time, um, you know, 
try it, right? The the only thing you might lose is maybe an hour of your time, right? But it's a really an opportunity to talk to someone who understands, who's non-judgmental, um, who's not going to tell you your problems don't matter, right? Who's really going to offer empathy and support. And that really goes a long way. It can be really meaningful and healing to hear somebody say, I see you and I see how hard this is for you and you're not alone and there's nothing wrong with you um, and to help you figure out how to make the situation better. So I really encourage anybody considering it um, to reach out and, and find uh, a provider, whether it's through Amita Health or the Family Institute or support groups with NAMI. There are a lot of resources out there and, and therapists who really want to be able to provide you with support. Right, thank you. How about Dr. Somerville? Uh, just take it in a slightly different direction, which is sort of group sessions that, that you have with people and how that might work when it can't be done in person. Yeah, yeah. So I was I was thinking about that as Dr. Gooden was talking. Um, we have right now we have nine different kinds of support groups um, that we're running via Zoom. And so they meet, there's about 21 meetings per month. So there's quite a few that people could dial into. Um, but with a, with a group, um, you know, the difference is that uh, you'll, if you uh, accept to be videotaped, you'll, of course, be on the screen like we are. And um, it's, again, it's not the same as being in person, but it helps individuals realize that um, they're sharing with other individuals, peers, um, what they're going through, and there's a whole community there. So there's a sense of, um, even when we do our support groups uh, in, you know, it face to face, there is a real community that evolves around that, where people start understanding that, you know, they're not alone, they're in this with other people who have similar experiences. And um, so it, it's really, I, I think the support group with multiple people um, gives them as a, a, a community, a real community around um, dealing with their issues and learning what worked for one person or another person that may or may not work for you. So it's a lot of sharing. This is what I did. This didn't work for me. Um, and so, and, and in our groups, we're basically, we have a structure where people um, are all invited to speak, but they're not expected to speak. So an individual who comes to a group who is in a state of high crisis, maybe all they can do is sit and listen and take in that grain of hope that they hear from other people speaking. Maybe they're not quite ready to share, um, but they still get something out of it. And so in our groups, you uh, and I imagine this is true for other support groups, you share as much as you want and as little as you want. Um, so it, it becomes a, a source of strength for a lot of individuals. You know, I'm gonna put a plug. I'm gonna put a plug in for uh, sort of these confidential group settings where you, you can have you know these kind of int intimate con intimate conversations and know that no one's going to uh, just go tell other people that it's kept within that group and with the professionals in that group. I've never done uh, a, a group therapy like this, but I've been part of. Uh, an executive group a long time ago. And I did it because I'm the CEO of a company and it was sort of lonely and everything else. And the best thing about this, and I was in it for about seven years and we met once a month. Um, and the best thing about it is I walked away and I thought, oh, I thought I was the only one that had these problems. <laughs> and that, man, there's a whole bunch of people that got problems and maybe some are a lot worse than mine. It's not, uh, it, it, was, it was very um, um, comforting to know that and without having done that, I've never known that um, necessarily in my mind, you know, thinking about the weight of whatever the problems were uh, that I was feeling. Um, hey, do, I, we got a question in from Tom who said, um, what is the cost of mental health treatment for those without insurance? Uh, and I'll, I'll just start, I mentioned earlier the, um, uh, this city contract that we have with Amita Health. Um, and I know that that those um, who uh, can't afford to pay uh, through our general assistance program here at the city can still get assistance. But, but I don't know in general how that works and if either of you could elaborate more for Tom and others on the line. Sure, I can jump in. Um, so 
there are um, a good number of clinics, probably not as many as we would hope there would be, that provide some sliding fee scale option. So at the Family Institute, we have the Betty D. Harris Clinic and our fees slide down to $5 a session and up to $75 a session. And that depends on the family household income. And so we don't take insurance in that clinic. So you don't have to have insurance. Um, and our average fee is $15 a session. Um, so that's um, an option and we are accepting new cases, new clients through the clinic and we're doing all of that via telehealth. We have a location in Evanston, Northbrook, downtown Chicago and Westchester for when we're sort of back in person. But right now we're providing sessions virtually. Um, and I know that there are various sort of clinics throughout the Chicagoland area that have different sliding fee scales. Some take, um, you know, Medicaid um, and then have different sliding fee scales that can sort of range from, you know, down to five or, you know, up to usually it's up to about 75 or so. Um, and obviously there are some places that provide uh, free or no cost um, therapy. Right. Uh, I would add to that. Um, we offer all of our programs support groups um, free of charge. And that's because we do fundraising and we get donations from um, townships and grants and that sort of thing. So um, the support groups that we run are all free of charge. And there are, I think there are others also that have um, a kind of a, the sliding scale and also scholarships for people. I know we partner with Equestrian Connections for um, individuals who want to do an equine assisted therapy kind of experience and they will provide scholarships for individuals. And then in the end, if, if uh, a person can't pay, they will be able to take, you know, the, the class or the instruction or the therapeutic experience, usually um, free of charge anyway. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I think, goodwill out there to help people who need it um, and finding ways to help them do it, whether they have the resources or not. Medicare, of course, has, you know, expanded their mental health um, to expanded their resources for mental health. So I think um, it should not be an obstacle for people at all. And I, and I would go back to um, the federal government funding the crisis counseling grants to each of the states. Yeah, it's not just in Illinois, it's all over the country because the federal government recognizes, particularly after a disaster, um, that mental increased mental health services are needed. Um, you know, along those lines, I got a question that someone had asked uh, me, and this is from Sheila and Sarah, about if the Evanston Police Department receives a, a call about someone in a mental health crisis, where is that person taken? Um, if the person uh, in crisis is requesting assistance, uh, the police officers will call the paramedics uh, and the person will be taken to either St. Francis Hospital or to um, Evanst Evanston Hospital. Uh, if the person is not willing to be assisted, um, officers uh, have to deem them a danger to others or themselves in order to be taken to the ho to the hospital. Um, so those that's the proceed procedures that the police uh, take. Um, I will say Evanston Hospital um, has crisis workers on staff um, who are equipped to handle uh, these ind these individuals, uh, and that's both of our both of our hospitals. Uh, and nearly all of the Evanston Police uh, Patrol officers have completed a 40-hour crisis intervention uh, team, CIT team training, uh, taught by mental health professionals uh, for law enforcement, which trains them to identify people in crisis, assist them, convince them to get help. Um, and crisis uh, intervention team officers are on every shift here in Evanston. Um, I mentioned at the outset of this uh, conversation about uh, having, um, not until I was mayor did I realize the public health, the mental health, public mental health crisis that is existing in this, in this country. Um, it is, um, it is significant. We are not as a, um, you know, federal government, state, or even local putting enough resources. I um, mean, we're all limited by the resources, but we're not putting enough resources into helping people, um, with, uh, with mental health uh, issues um, and there needs to be more focus on on that. It's one of the reasons we're having this conversation is why I've asked them to be a part of the mayor's, of the mayor's task force 
Uh, but there's a lot more uh, that we can do. Um, but let's uh, let's segue, uh, you know, from from that to uh, one of the toughest um, parts of being mayor is um, I learned about suicides that happen in the community, and it breaks my heart. It still does right now. Um, every time that that happens. Um, and there's a lot of studies out there that talk about, you know, at times of, of national crisis that the suicide rate goes, goes up. And so um, I worry about that because I don't think any community is immune from that. Um, you know, what are the signs that, uh, that people, you know, should, should you know, be aware of and what are the, um, um, the services available to them? Where should they call? What, what should they do? Um, so why don't we start with you, Dr. Somerville, and then we'll go to Dr. Clayton. So, um, yeah, suicide is a, a very large concern in normal times, and especially so um, now. So we know that it's suicide is the second leading cause of death among individuals ages from six, six or 10 to 34, and it's the third leading cause of death for um, adults in the United States. So it's a very serious problem. Um, I think one of the things that we teach in mental health first aid is that um, if you if you see individuals who are struggling, um, the first thing that is important to do is to make sure that you acknowledge it. And the warning signs are a variety of different uh, kinds of things. Sometimes people withdraw they will not want to talk. Um, they will go into a room and isolate. Um, sometimes people will, uh, you know, change their eating habits. They'll they'll eat less. They will um, they will do things like um, not want to show up to regular activities that they ordinarily do. Um, and so there's, so the warning signs are, are very different um, for different people. Um, but it's important to communicate with them as much as possible and to make sure that you are acknowledging that you can see that they're struggling. So there's a myth that if you were to say to someone, um, it looks to me like you may be struggling a bit. And I wonder if you're, um, thinking about harming yourself. Um, that that might put that idea into their head. And that is a myth that if you see somebody struggling and you can, you should talk to them about it. Uh, you will not give them the idea to harm themselves or to end their lives if you ask them that question. Because if they're thinking about it, um, you're asking it will only acknowledge that you see them, that you care for them that um, you're willing to help them if you can. And so it's, so it's really important to have that conversation. And it's one of the most difficult things to do is to bring up the idea with somebody. Um, are you thinking of harming yourself? But um, yeah, it's, it's very important to do, so. Thank you. Dr. Gibbon? Yeah, I would just um, add, you know, a sense of hopelessness is certainly a sign um you know obviously people can feel hopeless and not um be considering suicide but if somebody seems really hopeless if they're sort of canceling a lot of plans for the future or you know refusing to make plans for the future right it may be a sign that they're sort of thinking they're not going to be alive for that um certainly a sense of withdrawal um you know feeling really down really low um a lot of self-loathing um can be also signs um and i agree with dr somerville that reaching out to someone can be really helpful you know when i'm talking with people um clients i've had who have had suicidal ideation often there's a sense that they're a burden that other people would be better without them alive um that people don't care about them and so having friends and family and loved ones reach out to people and say you know i care about you i love you you're not a burden like let me be here for you really can make a very big difference for people and so i encourage people to reach out if you're worried about someone um and i think part of it is you know supporting them you know asking them again yes you can ask somebody are you considering you know attempting suicide 
or something like that. And then knowing that you do not have to be their therapist, right? That you can connect them to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, and if you search that, you'll find the number and they have calling and texting options, um, you know, or this crisis hotline that um, Mayor Haggerty mentioned for the state of Illinois, um, but that you can sort of hold that they're upset without reacting and getting angry with them or you know, getting so upset yourself that suddenly they have to comfort you. So that's part of the challenge is just to be there and be present with them and show them that you care and you love them and you're gonna try to help them get the support that they need. Great, thank you. And for, the, for those of you that are watching, Dr. Gooden referenced the, the National Suicide Hotline. I just wanna provide that number if there's ever but anyone in your family or, or yourself, that's 1-800 two seven three eight two five five all right let's go to a uh, we got a, a, a question that someone posed uh, it's anonymous um a family member stopped taking prescribed medication two months ago and is unwilling to acknowledge the need to take them uh, any suggestions uh, to assist with getting them back on track before he relapses um uh, Dr. Gooden, you want to take this and then I'll give Dr. Uh, Somerville the next one. Sure. Um, so, you know, this is, it's really tough, right? Um, I'm assuming that the this person is asking about an adult. Um, and, you know, if an adult decides to stop taking medication, as frustrating and as difficult as that might be, it's, it's their prerogative. Um, and so I think the challenge is, for you all or the family members to say, you know, that they think they should take medication, that they think it's helpful, that they think, you know, it, you know, brings positive things to the person's life and that they're willing to help them reconnect to a physician or a psychiatrist um, to re-engage in, in medication treatment. Um, and then you sort of have to let the person make that decision, right? And and be there for that person. And maybe it could even be sort of helping them get connected to a therapist, right? And a therapist is probably better equipped to discuss the pros and cons of medication, right? Often people don't want to take medication for a myriad of reasons. And so having a space where they can talk about that um, without judgment can be really helpful. And so um, if you can help them connect to therapy, that could be helpful or a support group. Um, I'm imagining in a lot of the NAMI support groups, people are talking about their experiences with medications and the pros and cons. And that can also be a really motivating factor for someone to think, okay, yeah, maybe there's side effects, but it's actually helpful. Um, so those are the things that I'd recommend. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Summerall, I'll let you tag on to that if you have anything you want to add there, but we have another question. Uh, we have a child who has mental health uh, illness who lives with us. She is bipolar. What can we do to keep her out of the hospital during this time? So uh, this is kind of a, a similar question in that um, bipolar is one of those disorders that um, it's very easy for people to want to go off of the medication. So I think um, to the extent that the parents can make sure that, I don't know what the age of the child is, but the, the, the child should be on the medications that they've been prescribed. Um, I presume that they are uh, taking medications. And um, uh, make, you know, make sure that the, the remind, I think it's important to remind children or anyone actually who is struggling with medication, not medication, did I feel better without it, um, to kind of remind them of the benefits that they had when they were on their medications, you know, how well they could do their schoolwork, how well they could, um, how comfortable they could be sitting in front of the television and watching the whole cartoon instead of maybe getting up and feeling like they had to do something else. And, um, you know, pointing out these benefits of the medication. But I think that bipolar is a difficult one. Um, and I think it's just important that the parents are on top of the medication issue. I think also if they're concerned about their child's taking the medication, um, they should talk to their primary care physician. Sometimes medications might have side effects of um, altering a person's immune uh, system or capacity, weakening their capacity. And so they might want to check with their physician about that. Um, but, you know, and distract a child too. I think there's a lot of 
things that are um, being offered up there, offered now on television, via internet, with games and programs. And um, there's a lot of celebrities who are reading books to children. So having a lot of alternatives for um, the children who maybe are struggling more than others with this being at home with their family all the time. Thank you both. I would, can I add to that yeah, really sure. quickly? Yeah. Um, just sort of going back to some of the things we were saying earlier that structure is gonna be really helpful here, especially for children, right? Children do really well with structure and routine. And right now, a lot of things are up in the air. So providing structure, providing routines, making sure that the child is getting enough sleep, is eating well, is, you know, having space to play, right? And drinking enough water and all of those things. Those are things that also really help to manage um, bipolar disorder in addition to medication. And so making sure that those things are regular, right? So, you know, trying to manage the sugar intake and trying to manage some of these other things that could sort of spike a mood or do something like that can also be really helpful in addition to the therapy and the medication and some of those other things. I'm um, concerned about social isolation for older um, uh, residents that live, that live alone, that can't see their family uh, right, right now, uh, that um, get Meals on Wheels, and I'm a huge proponent of Meals on Wheels, uh, because not only the food, but it's the social interaction. And studies have shown that it's that social interaction on a regular basis that, you know, just just helps keep people's spirits up when they live alone and, and, and everything else. And here we are in this, you know, lockdown nation right right now, practically. Um, and, um, and, and there's a lot of uh, older Americans that are, um, you know, without any kind of interaction. So could you talk about any, um, uh, you know, solutions for that or, or how we ought to be thinking about, about that? Uh, Dr. Good, you want to start with you? Sure, yeah, I mean, I think this is um, a really big concern. Um, and like you're saying, right, this situation is sort of exacerbating an ongoing issue with older adults um, often being isolated and feeling isolated. And so, you know, whenever possible, if if family members can help um, their older adult family member to sort of create, you know, use some video conferencing tool, that's great. But in the absence of that, use the phone, right? Call, you know, call them, make sure that you're calling family members, make sure that you're, you know, checking in on them more regularly than you would. Um, and I don't know if there are, you know, I've heard of some churches doing sort of conference call um, church sessions instead of live ones, because if, you know, they have a lot of older adults that are members of the congregation, it can be easier to participate via phone. So that may be an option. There may be sort of some conference call resources that are out there. Um, but, you know, pick up the phone and, and call people and it may not be perfect. It may not be the same as in person, but making sure to check on people and spend a few minutes talking on the phone um, a few times a week or every day, I think can really do a lot to keep uh, older adults from feeling like they're all alone um, and navigating this without being able to see anyone. Yeah, you know, and there's also, um, there's some schools out there um, that are engaging young people while they're home in writing letters, um, becoming pen pals, um, you know, sending cards and that sort of thing. So I, I think everything, anything and everything that we can do um, to lift their spirits um, with all of the technology. And sometimes the technology, the best technology for a, a, that situation is a, a crayon on a piece of paper, um, you know, to help people feel connected and not alone. It's, it's not, you know, it is a problem. It's, it's, not, it's not something that we can mitigate entirely. We just need to do the best that we can and, um, you know, know that we're doing the best that we can. Right. There's no restriction on picking up the phone and calling and calling someone. Again, a lot of older uh, Americans don't, you know, aren't, you know, up on all the latest technology and Zoom and all all of this, uh, or to uh, put pens to paper. So those are, are, are good, good suggestions. Um, this this is a question we got from Leslie, and 
I see this in some of the emails that I receive as mayor. So Leslie's not the only one, okay? And I want you to know that Leslie, if you're watching, that has, that has this, because I, I see this from other people. Um, I am having anxiety about shopping at the grocery store. I cover my face and hands and wash when I return home. How can I settle my anxiety and should I be overly concerned? Um, and I also will hear from people, uh, from others that will say, well, I was there and I was doing everything that, you know, the governor's order said to do or the mayor's order said to, said to do. And still there were people there that didn't have a face mask on or were closer than six feet uh, from me. And that, you know, creates anxiety. I, I see it. I, I go to the grocery store. I see the looks in people's faces. Um, at times. So can you talk, can you talk about that kind of very explicit, you know, anxiety that's clearly related to the event that we're having right now? Uh, yeah. Dr., uh, yeah, Dr. Gooden, when you start. And we'll go to sure. Yeah. So I think, you know, first just acknowledging that your anxiety is, is trying to keep you safe. Right. And it's coming from this place of like it feeling like there's a danger and there's a threat out there that's sort of invisible, which is the reality and wanting to keep you safe. And so, you know, I think you, if you're feeling overwhelmed by the anxiety, maybe you consider getting your groceries delivered if that's an option for you. Um, if you feel like, you know, you still want to um, grocery shop, I think taking all of the precautions, going to a store that's really limiting the number of people that can be in there at the same, at the same time, maybe trying to go really early in the morning or when the store first opens so there's not many people. Um, and then I think, you know, we know that things like taking really deep breaths that are grounding can help calm and ease anxiety. If your mind sort of starts to roll a script about I'm going to get COVID-19 and then I'm going to get sick and then I'm going to be in the hospital and then it right like if it starts going down that train, you know, bringing it back and trying to let go of those thoughts and sort of check in with yourself. How do you feel now? Do you feel healthy in this moment? Can you breathe in this moment? Okay, right. That's the that's the concrete evidence that you have. Right. So maybe taking some deep breaths beforehand, right, going to the store, limiting the amount of time you're in the store, doing all of the, you know, sanitation and washing procedures that um, have been advised when you get home. And then maybe it's sort of sitting down, take, taking another few deep breaths, grounding yourself um, when you get home. The other thought I have is when you're in the store, if you're starting to feel anxious and overwhelmed, you can do a grounding technique that we call uh, noticing five things. So look around and notice five things you can see, five things you can hear, five things you can feel physically or smell, if, you know, just keying into your senses to get your mind to settle into the present moment can be another way to manage anxiety if it becomes overwhelming while you're out. Yeah, you know, I, I would actually say I really connect with this um, this person's question because I have had the same anxiety going to the grocery store. And um, I think one of the things that has helped me is to decide in advance what I'm going to do to protect myself. And again, you know, what we've been told by the, the professionals with the mask and the gloves and the sanitizers and kind of do my checklist before I go. And then while I'm there, I spend as little as time as possible, um, which isn't always uh, easy. But uh, and then when I come home, do the same checklist about, you know, am I leaving my groceries outside the door? Do I take my shoes off before I go in and have that checklist in my mind? So I feel like I'm managing my anxiety in that moment by taking control. These are the controls that the, the switches that I'm flipping be in control of this anxiety. Um, and I would also say that um, there are some stores now that are doing a really good job. I won't name names, name brands, but there are some big box stores that are taking extraordinary precautions um, for individuals. And I went to one just recently and felt extremely safe there in contrast to the grocery store. And I would also recommend um, maybe going to local grocers, local markets who themselves you know, need customers at this time. And oftentimes you'll find fewer people in those stores if it's a small grocer. Yeah, this is new for everybody, right? For us as individuals, for us as families, 
um, and for the businesses, right, that support our entire community. So I do think that we are seeing improvements. Our health department, I want everybody to know this, our health department uh, is working very closely with our grocers and the big box stores, Target and the others, to make sure that they are instituting, you know, policies and procedures that are compliant with all of the public health guidelines. Um, and I think they're only going to get better. Okay, yeah. you're right. You will see somebody that's not six feet apart. You will see somebody that doesn't have a mask, all of that. Uh, but I think each day we're continuously getting better at this. And um, at least for me, that brings some level level of, you know, re relief. Um, and I also know some people uh, along what you guys were saying are thinking about exactly what time they're going to go to, right? They got their whole checklist. I'm going to do all this and I'm going to go at this time because I think there's less people at the store and that uh, sort of... Um, you know, relieves my anxiety. Um, I want to thank both of you for spending an hour uh, with so many of us here in Evanston. We usually have anywhere between two and 3,000 uh, views of folks that, that tune in either for the whole thing or at some point uh, during this. So we found these to be really helpful to the community. I'm really glad that we could have a session today to talk about the importance of mental health for all of us you know, make, trying to maintain the best mental health we can during this uncertain and difficult time. Um, I'm going to uh, end with um, uh, a question that I, uh, I'm going to end with uh, a question that we just got from Anika. And I, I, we try to answer bits of this during the session, but I'm going to really cover it, try to cover it more comprehensively right now, which is what resources is the city offering? Uh, to help people with mental with mental health issues. So I mentioned the contract that we have with Amita St. Francis, okay, which allows to get mental health assessments, one-on-one -on -one, uh, visits. It would be tele telehealth, not home visits right now. Um, so consultation with uh, mental health professionals. Um, and to access that, uh, I'm suggesting you call 311, which is the city's 311. That's all you have to punch into your phone and they will, and they will connect you. Um, we also have a social worker um, at the library. Um, and this is, we were pretty cutting edge to get a social worker at the library. We did it a couple of years ago. We used uh, some of the funds from our Good Neighbor Fund at Northwestern University. Um, and I'm going to give her name and I'll even give her, her number and the hours that she works uh, for anyone. Um, and that's Christine Mendez. And Christine's number is 847 448 eight six five nine that's her city number you can leave a message for it she checks her voicemail um and, uh, and she's working monday through friday 10 10 to 6 p.m um so we have that available to the community and i'll also say we have um the illinois mental health collaborative for access and choice uh that you can find at illinois mental health collaborative.com it's an awfully long email address excuse me, website, or you can call 1-866-359-7953. There's also the National Alliance on Mental Health, uh, and that helpline is 312-563-0445. Uh, trained counselors are available Monday through Friday from 9 to 5, 5 p.m. there. And uh, again, if you were feeling really desperate and had suicidal ideation thoughts or anything like that, the National Mental Health Suicide Line is 1-800-273-8255. Uh, so lots of resources uh, available to try and help people. Still not, still not enough out there in the world. Um, and I want to end with this question from Patricia. Patricia asked me, um, can anything be done to uh, reopen community gardens? This would really improve gardeners' mental health and help produce more fresh veggies. Uh, and the same question I get, Patricia, related to our farmer's market, which we have um, every year and it starts on, on May 1st. So I'm going to put those, put those two together um, and say um, we are going to continue to look at um, outdoor activities that people can do safely and still practice uh, strict social distancing. Uh, the farmer's market uh, has been setting up procedures and everything else to open on May, on May 1st here. Uh, again, it will be different than it has been. There may be one-way uh, rows or aisles that people are going up and down, uh, but it's a market, and again, it produces, you know, important fresh, you know, produce for all of us and so many people, and we want to support farmers, um, but we just need to do it in a healthy and safe, and safe way. 
uh, we will look uh, to do the same thing with the community gardens. Uh, right now, the, the governor's stay at home order runs through April 30th. Uh, as we've seen in other states, they are extending that stay at home order in, into May. Uh, we don't know yet what Governor Pritzker and his team are going to do. Um, just to manage expectations, I wouldn't personally be surprised if it's, ex if it's extended here. Um, and, um, um, but, you know, as it's extended, we'll see if the same rules apply, if they start to modify. And at a local level, we're working on developing and implementing a recovery plan for our, for our community to get back online. And there's lots of people around the city, community groups, as well as uh, city employees that are, that are working on this. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, I want to remind everyone that this too shall pass, as it will, uh, and we will get through this. I am very confident of that. Um, but it will test our resolve um, and our patience and our mental health, all of us. Uh, but we, uh, we will uh, get through this. So. Uh, thank you. Uh, we look forward to uh, joining our next um, uh, coronavirus uh, Q&A. Uh, keep checking in with the city website and we'll post that and have a, uh, a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Dan. You. Thank you, Dr. Samuel. Thanks so much. Thank you.